Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name's Dave Marshall and for the last time I'm being joined by Tom Fletcher and we're speaking about the final episode of Life on Our Planet, episode 8. Tom, it's it's been an emotional ride. It has, hasn't it? Are you sick of me yet? I I was already sick of you before we started. So. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> <laughs> the question uh, is whether our audience are sick of both of us. <laughs> I can imagine so, but no, I, I've really enjoyed this. It's been really nice to re- revisiting things and seeing uh, scenes again, and and just yeah, I, it's all flooded back to me, which is really nice. So yeah, thank you for inviting me. No problems. Right, you know what you've got to do. Oh no, are you ready? Okay. I think so. Yep. Episode eight in fourteen seconds. Go. Episode 8 is all about the latest chapter in the evolution of life on Earth, and we see lots of mammals that are familiar ourselves in the very last part of it. Uh, It's quite an emotional episode and one that sums up nicely what we're doing to the planet. 14 seconds. Is it 14 seconds? Perfect. Wow. Wow. We are ending on perfection. (laughs) Good. (laughs) This this couldn't have gone better. (laughs) Right. So. Uh, this is the episode in which we get our message, I think, for the whole series. And I think it is a really important episode to tell. Yes, um, it's, I think it's quite easy, really, to um, when, when you've got natural history programs to, to come across as uh, preachy sometimes. And it's a really fine line to get a message across while still... Um, being entertaining and also providing information objectively. So this episode's really impressive because it it does talk about uh, the the evolution of humans and our society and the impact we have. But it's it is part of the story. It, it is it is set in the context of the evolution of, of of life on Earth, and this is this is the conclusion of the evolution of of mammals from our perspective. And yeah, you, you're led through that journey uh, with with the same aplomb and skill that has been applied to the rest of the series with incredible photography and really nice storytelling. So it's, it's really only in the last sort of five or 10 minutes that we, we, we are introduced to, uh, to humans. Uh, the rest of the episode is talking about possibly one of the most exciting times, uh, which is the ice age and, and the mammals and birds and all sorts of things that, that dwell in that period of geological time. Yeah, so we do look at the the science first with uh, Professor Danielle Shreve from Royal Holloway University, and then we delve into all of those details about how the episode was constructed, what kind of scope it had, what were the stories that needed telling, and what were the messages that we needed to get across. How were we going to get those across? How were we going to end it off? All of those things come into that. And so, Tom... Again, what are your favourite scenes from this? Um, well, I'm a little bit biased because I was I was there um, next to Gavin Thurston. He's an incredible um, cinematographer and camera operator. He spent two weeks with me um, in a small boat uh, in the Danube Delta in Romania. And uh, we watched these lovely little birds called Whiskered Turns. And their part of the story is is uh, highlighting the the challenges that come with um, the reduction in temperature and increases in temperature. The water worlds that emerge on either side of an ice age, the the interglacial periods, and these these little birds are, are, are very charming and beautiful. And we've got some really nice slow motion footage of them. But um, they're really highlighting the challenges of, of living in a water world. They they make their nests actually on the water itself. They make nests out of reeds. Uh, that float on the water and they're constantly stealing each other's nest material because it's in short supply, constantly being watched by all sorts of predators from either side. But it's a really nice, neat little sequence and I I was very proud to be part of that process. Oh, that's lovely. I think for me, mm, again, it's one of of those ones where it's it's a a sum of its parts. There's there's nothing that I liked more than stepping back and looking at the whole i think so there's things in it like the the stone stacks that those uh humans were using i was like wow i did not know that and in the in the conversation with uh danielle we're talking about entire huts being made out of mammoth bones and all of these 
kind of uh, early human uses for bone and constructions and all of everything that we can figure out about them, uh, the the level of accuracy in which they can carbon date things, all of those uh, bits, nuggets of information I got from Danielle, I really took a lot out of that. Oh, good. Yeah, I, there was a hell of a lot of research that went into the the, the human aspects, especially um, out of respect for uh, for the people, because I mean, we, we are so close uh, in time to the to those those people that um, we we know an awful lot about them, and and we can we can make really informed um, decisions about how to to portray it. And ultimately, the episode is a uh, it, it's quite a. The rest of the series takes you through a journey of, of evolution, and the first half of the episode is very much sticking to that. We've got the mammoths, and we've got the uh, the baboons telling the story about you know kind of the the social structures grow, uh, building up and that kind of thing, and then we get plunged into a world which is quite familiar. One of the best things, really, I, I suppose, about getting to this point in the series is that um, we do know more about these animals because they're more recent. The, the mammoths, especially, you know, we've just we've got mummies of these things, ice mummies of these things. Um, so the the wealth of information we've got about these animals is, is spectacular, and it's all been applied to the film. Are ice mummies fossils, Tom? Uh, well, I think they're more like raisins or jerky, aren't they? Really, they're they're sort of dried out by the <laughs> by the ice. Mm. So I, whether you consider uh, jerky a fossil, I mm-hmm. think the same sort of thing would apply to a uh, to a frozen mummy mammoth. But uh, no, I, I think for it to be a fossil, doesn't it have to have some kind of permineralization? Isn't there a sort of chemical? It's, it's got to be lithified. I lithified. Believe. Chemically stabilized within okay. a rock, potentially. Or okay. the, the way we're entering into a world of taphonomy here. Yeah. Again, uh, please write your answer on a postcard. <laughs> <laughs> if you have the answer to that. Much obliged. Send it to is this a fossil? P.O. Box. I don't know. I don't know. Wasn't it two five two last time? Yes. P.O. Box eleven thousand two hundred. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose this this is going to bring up a debate uh, about whether you know a, a piece of meat that you've left in the back of your freezer for a year is a fossil or not. <laughs> oh. Mm. The pedantics of paleontology that nobody ever sees. <laughs> the other thing I should mention as well is is that we we also, for the first time in this series, actually have first hand accounts of the animals to base our reconstructions off, because we've got uh, we've got mammoths and cave lions, and cave lions are actually they're, they're painted on on the walls of caves by early humans. So it's only because of those those drawings that we know that they had manes travelled in. Uh, packs. Sorry, what's a um, what's a what's a, a cats group called again? The words escaped me. Pride. Pride. They, they did travel in pride. Um, so we've got first-hand evidence, really, for the first time in the series of of what these these animals were doing in prehistory, which is pretty unique. Yeah, those those paintings in France are absolutely gorgeous. When you when because you, when you think that they are the first. Cave, the oldest cave paintings, and they are that beautiful. There are so many of them; they're absolutely gorgeous. If you've not seen them yet, you really need to have a look online. So then, Tom, as a as a short little retrospective from our points of view, how has working on life on our planet been for you? Not to be too dramatic, but it has been a kind of awakening, I suppose, in many ways. Um, I, I was uh, working at the University of Leicester, very much an academic, doing lectures and that kind of thing. And uh, it, was, it was really nice. But having taken, uh, taken to this industry, I mean, these are the best storytellers on earth and they are reaching millions, if not tens of millions of people with these films. So the science communication is is just incredible. The reach is incredible, and the way that they do things is just so full of passion and so full of love. I think I think the love that goes into these films is is immaculate. It's wonderful, and I, I felt I felt really at home being surrounded by. Uh, they are scientists. I mean, you know, loads of people here have got degrees in zoology and the likes, and it it just shows that they are incredibly curious about everything around them they're fascinated by by everything about nature 
Um, I think having me in the office as a sort of you know fact machine was, was really interesting for them. But I, I was learning so much uh, about the process of filmmaking. It has been a real wake up call about the way that I communicate science. Some of the mm. worst people to talk about science actually are probably scientists. We we don't have the skills to tell stories quite as well as these these people, these professionals. Um, sometimes there are some obviously there are some fantastic lecturers, but knowing that the most effective way of of communicating information is by telling stories. It, I mean, it's one of the most ancient ways of of conveying information is to tell stories. Um, that that was a real that was a real treat to see happen. And I completely agree. I I saw that too. Definitely, I, it has it has changed me working on Loop, and I'm incredibly thankful uh, to be able to see that craft, to be able th to think about things not purely in academic terms, but in the necessity for reaching people with the messages in um, in formats that are, are right for them, are right for the audience. So yeah, there was a big change in there for me. And I guess in general, I'm just incredibly thankful that they decided to show a fuller story. They decided to have context from uh, the modern world to tell this whole story of life on the planet, uh, life on our planet, sorry, and not just dinosaurs. It must be so tempting to just say, we're just going to do dinosaurs. This is what the public are interested in. This is the most interesting stuff that we can find in uh, the history of life on Earth uh, and just um, deliver that. But the stories that made it in are, are what makes this series for me. It's all of the crunchiness. It's all of the tentacles. It's all of the petals. It's all of the pollen. It's all of the lichen and all of the little things that you just wouldn't expect from an, uh, a documentary like this. Yeah, I completely agree. It's uh, the, the, the detail involved is, is wonderful and it's uh, such a celebration of biodiversity and a love letter to earth, really. It's something very precious that we've only got one of and we need to cherish. Okay, Tom. Well, I guess that about rounds it up for us and our introductions. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for spending your evenings with me uh, talking about this. Uh, it has been very enjoyable. It's been an absolute pleasure. Really, really has. Thank you. And if you have enjoyed this series, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear what you made of it, because this is this is a format that I don't think has really been done before. Nobody's really taken the time to look at a documentary and use that as a vehicle for more information. And it'd be really interesting to see how that works. So if you did enjoy it, we'd absolutely love to hear from you. What worked, what didn't work, uh, what have you learnt? Uh, from listening to this series, what more could we have done? All of this is going to be really important for us creating this kind of uh, material in future. So I'd really honestly appreciate the feedback and thank you for listening all the way to the end. It's been an absolute pleasure to bring this to you. So we've got three great interviews for you now um, that will wrap up this whole series. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you and I hope you've enjoyed every moment of it.